Hello there, everyone. My name is Kathleen O'Brien, and I'm on the board of the Community Arts in Bellevue. And we're excited tonight to deliver to you the second of a three-part series with Cheekwood, um, who is celebrating their 60th anniversary in Nashville, and it's become quite a treasure over the years. Um, the first installment was last week, and we spoke with Jay McLeod, the president and CEO, and she gave us a really good overview uh, of Cheekwood and the Chihuly exhibit that's on there now. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about sculpture. Next week, we're going to talk about the gardens uh, that they have at, at Cheekwood. But tonight, sculpture, we have an amazing woman with us. Her name is Marin Sullivan, and she happens to be the curator of sculpture at Cheekwood. But she has more than one job. She is Chicago-based. She's a, an art historian and curator. And actually, in addition to her cheek, Cheekwood position, she works for Batoya Razani, and I may not be pronouncing that right, the, um, the Harry Batoya catalog uh, Razani, and is co-curator of, of that exhibit, because um, I'm not trying to pronounce it a second time, that was organized <laughs> by the Nasher Sculpture Center. Um, she specializes in the histories of modern and contemporary sculpture, sculpture, and she is also an author of a book and has written numerous essays. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to Marin Sullivan. Welcome here tonight with us for Live from the View. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, a real treat to get to talk about sculpture any evening and, and particularly sculpture in conjunction with what we're doing at Cheekwood. Well, we're, we're glad to have you here. And we know that sculpture is such an important part uh, of Cheekwood. So let's just jump right into it. Um, tell us about the history of the Carroll Trail. Yeah, so we're looking at a slide here of kind of how it used to be or our old signage. Um, and, you know, the Carroll Trail is something that was initiated at Cheekwood in 1995. Um, then museum director at Cheekwood, John Wettenhall, um, had gotten uh, an NEA grant to go and travel in Europe and look at sculpture parks and sculpture gardens there. And, you know, I think he was very much caught with what he saw visiting places like the Yorkshire Sculpture Park in Northern England uh, or the Forest of Dean uh, near Wales. And he really wanted to bring uh, some of the elements that he saw in Europe, especially in the UK, um, back to Nashville and to his position at Cheekwood. And so he initiated the project with the board's approval in 85. And um, over the next few years, really thought uh, very thoughtfully about how sculpture could work with the site and in our particular landscape at Cheekwood. And so, you know, he, he was modeling it after these European examples, but it was really important for him and, and the whole team at Cheekwood during that time to select not just international artists or even national artists, but also bring in some regional artists. So the, the trail really was a combination from the beginning of a diverse range of artists. We have um, uh, representations from numerous countries and, and numerous regions around the United States. So he very much wanted it to kind of be a good cross section of what was going on in sculpture at the time. Um, and certainly he was thinking about how he could engender greater conversations between art and gardens, right? These are the two kind of pillars of what we do at Cheekwood. And so uh, the, the trail itself is about a one and a half mile loop in total. There's two actual loops now, but it's about a mile and a half long loop. And, uh, and it's in a more wooded area of our trail and or of our, of our campus. And so he very much was thinking, you know, we, we have a lot of gardens at Cheekwood. We have this great history and we really have this wonderful collection of art. How can we create a space that does both of those things together? And I really think it's the dialogue between art and nature, art and gardens, uh, art and landscape um, that we really see out on the trail uh, even today, you know, 20, 20 something years later. So the project was initiated in 95. It was fully established in 1999. And the whole project really was made possible through the generosity of of Anna Monroe Carroll Jr. and their family. And that's of course why it's named as such. Um, so they really enabled us uh, to make this happen both in terms of kind of the infrastructure at Cheekwood and also were really involved in the selection of works um, at, at um, 
on the trail as well. And, you know, the the works that are on the trail not only are a kind of diverse mix in terms of the, the artists that made the sculptures, um, but also very much in terms of the fact that some, a, a good percentage of the work um, on the Carroll Trail were commissioned or made specifically for Cheekwood. Um, so, you know, we have a, lots that were purchased, uh, very thoughtfully purchased, I would say, and, and carefully kind of placed uh, in the landscape. But we also have, you know, works that are very unique right? They were made specifically for the institution, for the site, and the artists that were commissioned to do this really were, were thoughtful about how um, their particular work would respond to their particular little area along the trail. Well, you've used the word thoughtfulness an awful lot, and, <laughs> and, um, and, and that's a good thing. Um, when, when you think of nature and you think of art, you think, uh, especially sculpture, but any art, um, there's the, the reflective part of your life that that allows you to enter mm -hmm. and when you add art and nature together both individually uh, allows an individual to be reflective it's it's meant to do that but together it, it's just a wonderful way for people to unwind fix a problem just enjoy the man-made and the god-made <laughs> yeah, and I, and I definitely think, you know, on the trail as well, you know, my thinking around or use of the word thoughtful also has to do, you know, I think a lot of people maybe who aren't familiar with, with museums or certainly what we do as curators, you know, it's... Uh, it's very, oftentimes a lot of, I think people maybe have more negative reactions to seeing work out in the public space. And part of it has to do if if work isn't thoughtfully cited, right? If It's not as easy as just kind of taking any sculpture and putting it in any spot. You really do want to think about that dialogue and that conversation that has it. And I think, you know, the more thoughtful you can be about that process, the better kind of experience it generates for, for visitors um, and for what it makes you start to think about um, during that experience. Which kind of defines the word curator, right? <laughs> it, we do do something special. <laughs> so why don't you tell us what some of the commissions were, uh, some of the early pieces for uh, the trail in the early stages of this? Yeah, absolutely. So as I mentioned, some of the works were created specifically for our site. And we're looking here at one of those pieces, um, a work by the British artist Sophie Ryder. This is her crawling lady hair. Um, and, you know, we see the date on this work of being 1997. And, and the creation date of that work is actually because Sophie uh, was on site in Cheekwood in Nashville for about a five week residency during the summer of 1997. So she had been in communication uh, with John Wittenhall, then director, and uh, she and her family actually came to Nashville and, and were on site creating the work here. So it wasn't even just that the work was created, you know, for this particular location, but literally created out in the forest um, on site. And, you know, we, we have these kind of great archival records um, of the entire staff, really, and community coming to help Ryder uh, actually assemble this work. So what we're actually looking at here, it's kind of hard to see this, this piece is, um, uh, it has a, a steel armature underneath. And then the actual surface texture is built up by this really, really amazing work of wire, right? So she's bending and twisting and, and curving all these pieces of wire that kind of creates the surface texture of this. And when you visit Cheekwood, you'll actually notice that, you know, you can kind of see through the work as much as it is, you know, it's not fully opaque. It, it does have some transparency to it. Um, and this was a very laborious process for, for, for Ryder to create. And so, you know, it was kind of all hands on deck, right? The, the, the museum team was out there, but also board members, community members, everybody kind of pitched in and, and, you know, our, our, our archives really speak highly of everybody just really loving the experience um, of, of helping to create this work. Um, and you'll also notice when, when you visit Cheekwood and see this piece. This is, I think, one of our um, kind of fan favorites, really. Families really love this piece. And, um, you know, a lot of people, you know, reflect that this is one of their favorites on the trail. And um, and you'll notice that unlike a lot of other pieces, this is kind of set a little bit back from the trail. You don't really have access to this piece in the way that you do with the others. Um, and that's really because of the fragility of that wire, right? Um, we, we, we don't want really anybody... Um, 
getting very handsy with our sculpture. Uh, some of them are a little bit more interactive than others, but this is one that we really don't want people climbing or touching on because that wire can bend. And and part of uh, you know our our intent at Sheepwood having work outside is to really make sure we're being good stewards and and keeping this work intact and and well preserved so that future generations can can enjoy it as well. So this is set a little bit further back, um, but you can see it from both sides of the path, and it really does have a have a presence to it. Um, this is kind of this became one of her key symbols in uh, her artistic practice. This kind of hybrid human hair form. Um, she also has a more kind of male figure that has half minotaur. Um, so she kind of creates these fantastical creatures. Um, and this is this is an early example of one of these. Uh, she would go on. She has gone on to to do many more different variations of lady hairs. But this is one of her earliest ones. So it's a a pretty special piece for us to have at Sheepwood. I can only imagine how uh, there must have been a gazillion pinch me moments for <laughs> the staff that was involved as this was created on site, right? It was created yeah. on Do you know how long that process took? I mean, the whole residency was five weeks. I'm guessing she's not working every day of that. And there was yeah. some kind of, you know, prep time and and, and end time. But but a, a good solid, I would say, probably four weeks of working um, was devoted to this. So, so yeah, very, very um, laborious uh, uh, practice and very hands-on, right? I mean, she was um, kind of involved or overseeing every twist of every wire. So um, it's great. How tall of the is the piece? Um, you know, it's, I can't remember exact measurements, but probably that like horizontal torso that you see, yeah. um, is probably about six feet, um, wow. up from the ground. So it's, a, it's a, it's a very large, uh, work. It again, has that kind of presence and, uh, you know, feels very much like it's crawling through the forest. Well, for an artist to create something on site with that kind of a time frame that has to endure all different types of temperatures and weather conditions that it was a, a huge undertaking. It's yeah, and she was here in the summer, so, you know, it was warm. <laughs> it, it is absolutely stunning. Um, so anything else on this? Let's talk about this next slide. The, the yeah, slide. so another really... A really great commission, another commissioned piece made specifically for the trail for this has been, both of these works have been exactly where they were, you know, originally installed since they were installed. Um, and we're looking here at a, a piece called Tree Poem by John T. Scott. And this, this piece may be an artist that you're not, uh, unfortunately, maybe not super familiar with, but he is, he was a really um, remarkable, significant American sculptor. Um, he was from, from and based in New Orleans most of his life. Um, he actually won one of the MacArthur Genius Awards or so-called Genius Grants um, in 1982. So just a little bit before creating this work. Um, and, you know, he uh, was approached by John Wenton Hall to create a piece for uh, the trail. And, you know, this has a really interesting process to it because he came out to Cheekwood um, and kind of walked to the grounds and saw the trail, saw how it was coming along. And then he returned to his studio in New Orleans and he actually asked um, the staff at Cheekwood to go and take pictures um, of trees that were around this particular location. And they sent him these photographs of the trees and he kind of carefully selected which ones he liked and uh, then made drawings of those trees, um, you know, modified photographs of the trees and then used a special laser cutting technique to cut out those exact trees in the aluminum. So it kind of creates this interesting dissonance, right? Where you have, uh, you know, artificial metal trees that are based on actual trees that were at the site and maybe continue to be at the site. Um, and then because they're made out of this really um, precise, you know, precision cut aluminum that's pretty thin, when you when you kind of turn the corner on this piece, it looks flat, right? Um, but the actual surface of the work is super reflective. So then you get an, an additional layer where it's reflecting the trees around it. So you really start to think about this kind of artificial nature natural kind of conversation that's happening right you're looking at trees but they're sculptural trees um and he that's also why he has one that's kind of uh, fallen on the ground that was also a photograph of a fallen tree at that time and so he wanted it to feel like you were kind of you know you kind of turn a, a corner coming up the trail and you happen upon this work and uh and you you kind of catch yourself because you they you register them as trees but they're obviously not trees they're sculpture um and you know the the kind of final stage of this installation or commissioning project was John Scott coming back 
to Cheekwood to install the work with his team. Um, and, you know, he talks very much about for him, the work really wasn't completed until he installed it. Really up until the point where he finishes installing the work at Cheekwood, he's in, he's improvising, he's changing things, he's, he's moving them around and, and doing slightly different modifications to that. And, and he talked a lot about his sculptural practice um, being really influenced by jazz and improvisation. So for him, there, there was a kind of this rhythm of creating this work. And, and, I, and I really always make a point to talk about this reference to jazz and improvisation, because I think when you um, see these, especially in person and you see reflections happen or the clouds move and the light refracts off of these differently, you, you sense, there's, a, there's a sense of rhythm, right? And, and a kind of dynamism to these works. So even though they're these very, very, you know, uh, object steel or aluminum trees, they, they do feel pretty fluid and they feel like they move. And so there, there is a lot of um, uh, interesting kind of experientials that happen around this piece as well. Well, there you go again, using the word reflective. So we're getting <laughs> reflecting from the reflections and it actually looks um, in, in this slide like it, it's something white on a piece of glass. Um, yeah, so have that illusion. Uh, uh, I mean, it's perfect. Absolutely yeah, perfect. And when you get up close, you can't see it in the image. But when you get up close, there's actually kind of this this kind of patina or surface texture that you can actually see lines um, in the surface. So it's also changing when you're really up close to the work versus when you kind of walk by it. Um, there's different kind of uh, textures and, and effects as well. And, you know, the interesting kind of connection just around the kind of corner on, off of the trail behind the mansion um, is a work by another sculptor named George Rickey. And, and actually John T. Scott started using aluminum after doing a residency at Ricky's uh, studio in upstate New York. So there was a kind of interesting, um, there's an interesting connection between the two sculptors that we have uh, on campus as well, which is nice. And he he really uh, started to increase his use of aluminum after, after his work with Ricky, who was also very famous for his aluminum sculptures. So it, 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 it speaks to so many things because it is fluid and you can feel that movement and rhythm and it makes sense that you had mentioned um, that he's been influenced by jazz. It looks like trees on tree. It, it's yeah. just, it's just absolutely stunning. Now this is one that people can get much closer to than the last one that we looked at, right? Yeah, and that was something, you know, certainly we'll talk a little bit about what we've done in terms of enhancements to the trail coming up, but, you know, something for me, and this is uh, you know, part of my curatorial and art historical training, um, you know, the, the joy of sculpture is that you get to see it in the round, right? And it changes as you walk around sculpture. So for me, it was really important to make sure that all of our outdoor sculpture is as accessible as possible from as many angles as possible. Um, and so certainly, you know, as you kind of come up around the bend and then you go around the back side, this work looks like a completely different work. And that's something to me that's really, you know, why I'm kind of such a sculpture fanatic is, you know, um, you really get all these multiple vantage points and, and different views. And, you know, it's nothing against painting, but um, really the, the, the effects and lighting effects and environmental effects really dramatically change this work. You know, seeing this work in, in you know, summer on a sunny day versus winter on a cloudy day, it looks really different. So it's also really dynamic and changes throughout the year um, as well. Does it, it was it installed with its footing into the ground or is it so it's 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 got some foundation that's buried. Exactly. So there is a foundation underneath that you can't see. So you have you kind of see um, you can just barely sit on the one that's kind of fallen. Um, there are these kind of posts that that fasten uh, the work, but there right. is a kind of uh, an infrastructure underneath that you can't see. And that was, you know, very much the artist's intent and our intent. We we wanted, you know, the, the effect that we want to go for is that these are rooted into the ground. So with wind, it looks like some of these branches are um, off by themselves. They're, they're from, they have the base of the trunk, but mm -hmm. it's off branches that are off by themselves. Does the wind impact? Is there movement with wind? You know, not too much uh, because the aluminum is thick enough. Uh, it is really pretty sturdy. Um, but certainly, I think if we had a really big gusty wind, it, it might, uh, you know, move might slightly. Um, you know, certainly the, one of the next pieces we come up uh, or coming up also has a lot to do with wind. So there is a kind of, you know, kinetic um, motion element on some of our works on campus. But this one's pretty, it's a pretty sturdy uh, collection of trees. Well, Nashville has been so fortunate um, to have the Carroll family um, 
care so much about the the civic furniture, uh, if you will. Um, yeah, but it's certainly part of that. Tell us what makes this Carol Trail. I mean, we've seen a little bit. What makes it so special? Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, yeah, and actually, uh, you know, this is the work I was kind of referencing about the wind. Uh, Doug Hollis's high back wind heart chairs. Uh, these actually extend really, really, really tall up. They're very vertically oriented, and you can just barely see it across that top bar of the chair back, as it were. Um, there's actually piano wire that comes up. Um, on the top of these pieces and Hollis intended them to have a very musical component to them. So on a very windy day, if you're, if you happen to be out on the Carroll Trail, um, you might hear some reverberations coming from those taut piano wires. Um, so he was somebody, uh, Doug Hollis was an artist who was, who's very interested um, in uh, sound and sculpture and how those two things um, interact with one another. A, a kind of like funny anecdote I always like to mention with Hollis is that uh, he, he created a work actually in, in Seattle for the National Oceanic um, and Atmospheric Administration. Um, and it's actually the, the name of that piece is Soundgarden, which is where the, the kind of famous, famous 90s band took their name from. So, um, you know, he's definitely had an influence in all sorts of ways, but but sound is something that's really important. And I think, you know, thinking about a piece like high back wind harp chairs, I think one of the elements that really makes um, the Carol Trail really unique is that we have um, a real diversity of styles and types of sculpture, right? I think when you come to the Carol Trail, um, you obviously have a really just beautiful environment in which to walk around, but the type of sculpture that you see there, it's not just one type of sculpture. You know, we have figural sculpture, we have abstract sculpture, we have really colorful sculpture, some that kind of blend in to the natural environment um, and look like they kind of had always been there. So, you know, sculpture you can enter into or walk through, sculpture like these that you can actually Actually, we encourage you to sit on. Um, so, you know, there there are a lot of different styles of sculpture. And I think that really is an asset because for me as a curator of sculpture, you know, I always like to remind people sculpture isn't just one thing, right? Over its, over its long history, it's many different things. Um, and there's uh, all sorts of different materials that can be used, subject matter that can be evoked. Um, so, so certainly that kind of diversity um, of, of types of sculpture is something that really makes it unique. Um, uh, if we can go to the next slide, I think. Um, yeah, so he, another example uh, by Ian Hamilton Finley, a, a Scottish British artist. Um, you know, this is an example again of using a kind of natural material, so stone, and we we definitely have um, sculpture along the trail that's made out of marble, granite, um, limestone, different types of stone. Um, and you know, this is an example that references um, a, a line of writing from a French revolutionary. So sculpture can also be about text and history, which is another huge pillar of what we do at Chiquot is thinking about the lived history. Um, so, so there's, a, a, again, a, a, a huge different diversity of style and form and, and material. Um, and you can also get a sense from, from this image and, and the other photographs that we've been looking at. And I think this is probably one of the most unique features of the Carroll Trail at Chiquot is that it's wooded. Um, and this is something that kind of seems obvious, uh, definitely based on the pictures we've been looking at, but it's, it's not really common. I think a lot of times when you think about outdoor sculpture, um, when you think about um, sculpture parks, it's usually these kind of manicured open lawns or open green spaces um, that kind of have these big expanses. And what I really love about the Carroll Trail is that these are kind of um, works that you happen upon almost, right? And this is by design, right? We've, we've again, uh, they have been cited and continue to be maintained in a way um, that that is about their relationship to their immediate environment. Um, but the fact that you're kind of in this wooded canopy and, you know, you're being taken on this very circuitous path, um, that's something that, again, references to um, more kind of European or English models. It's pretty com it's much more common to have kind of wooded landscapes Landscapes, forested landscapes in, in conjunction with sculpture. But in the States, we really don't see that a lot. Um, so that's something that I think is an asset uh, that, that, you know, we can offer a, a unique kind of experience of, of outdoor sculpture um, because of that as well. About how large are some of these stones, would you guess? Or you might know, mm, in terms of I would say they range, you know, from maybe two or three feet up to probably five or six feet. So, you know, they're, they're pretty... Um, 
expansive and you can kind of get up close to read the text. Um, and, you know, certainly we have didactics that explain the kind of meaning behind the text. Um, this was actually something that uh, cr there's there's about five different versions of this sculpture, each in a different language. Um, so we have the Italian version um, at Cheekwood, uh, but there are versions in, um, you know, in English and Spanish um, uh, across the world. Um, so it's also, you know, very kind of international piece in that regard. Well, it, it's just beautiful. I, I guess people actually walk on these, don't they? We encourage no climbing of any sort on sculpture. So you can walk around them um, and we encourage you to kind of get up close. But but yeah, no, uh, uh, pretty much across the board, no touching or no climbing on any of our sculptures. There's, a, again, a couple that you can sit on um, and there's a couple you can enter through. And, you know, sometimes we get asked questions of like, oh, well, I can sit on this chair. Why can't I really touch the chair? Um, and that really has to do with the fact that our uh, we have oils on our hands that transfer. Um, so, so we really like to limit the kind of touching and, and um, you know, rubbing of, of various sculptures as much as we can, uh, even on the more interactive pieces. I think we, um, I can't, nothing specific comes to mind, but I do recall um, throughout my life seeing particularly bronze sculpture that where people have touched it in one place. Yeah, and it wears down. Good luck, and you can definitely tell where that touch has come for over the years. Yeah, yeah, and certainly I think those, like, you know, I think of, like, the, um, the boar in Florence, for example, where people have kind of rubbed its feet and its snout, and, you know, it becomes kind of part of that work, um, but certainly our, our sculptures at Cheekwood, we do want to try to maintain as best as possible, so we, we don't want to have uh, that type of interaction. Well, you guys have just gone through uh, a pretty extensive enhancement project. Yeah. Do tell what. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we are again tremendously thankful um, to the Carroll Family Foundation, who you know continue to remain committed to art and nature at Cheekwood. Um, so they helped us with a very, very uh, well endowed, um, long term um, uh, re enhancement project of of the sculpture trail, and this really has allowed us, you know, to take something that I think people already loved and enjoyed enjoyed and just make it better, right? And this is kind of why we refer to this as an enhancement project. Um, you know, in, in fundamentals, this is really a continuation of the vision for the trail and, you know, um, very much honors the legacy and intent behind it. Um, but really, again, I think brings a lot more to the equation. So there's there's a couple of things I want to highlight about the enhancement. And I think you can kind of get a sense of this in, in the pictures that you're looking at. Um, first and foremost, we really uh, looked to restoring um, and kind of doing a, a spring cleaning on, on all the sculptures that are along the trail. So, um, you know, uh, we had kind of conservators come in and our team came in and we really just made sure that all of the sculptures were kind of in tip top shape, right? Just reassessing them. It's been about 20 years since most of them were created or installed. Um, so really just kind of, you know, continuing to um, uh, commit to our stewardship of caretakers of these objects. So that was definitely um, a huge focus of the trail. But beyond that, um, some really great infrastructure improvements happened. Um, so first and foremost, um, we have two loops on the trail, and you can see this here. Um, we have two loops, and the, in the Hickory Loop, the first kind of main loop that you'll enter into, um, was all paved. So we have paving and this beautiful new boardwalk that was put in, um, and that really allows the trail to be accessible to more people, right? So if you are wheelchair bound, if you have a stroller, um, or if you just prefer walking on a nice, uh, even paved uh, path, um, the, 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 the main part of our loop, uh, our first loop is completely paved now. We also, as you can see in this middle image, um, put new benches in. So if you need to kind of take a moment to sit down and enjoy a sculpture or just enjoy the environment, um, this is now um, something that we can offer out on, on the trail. Um, also on the Hickory Loop, we have lighting, which I am super, super excited about because this means that when we have our Cheekwood at Night events um, around exhibitions or for holiday lights, um, people can also go out onto the trail and enjoy it after dark. Um, and we We've really taken great care to light the sculpture so you know they look really dramatic and they also that that changes how we experience them right so um, it's a it's a it's a new way of looking at that sculpture um, and and certainly you know I think in terms of that lighting it also makes it accessible for different types of activities um, different types of programming and this I think um, 
also has to do with you know making the the, the trail more user friendly. We've put a lot of effort into signage um, and wayfinding across the trail. So there's trailhead maps um, and different signage that kind of guide you through the trail experience. Um, but again, related to each specific work, um, there's new labels, label signs that are up in front of each work that tell you how you how you're allowed to interact with them, um, more information about them, what we call tombstone, the kind of basic information about each work. Um, and you also see on each object sign, um, two different features. One has to do with a little QR code that is uh, that you can scan with your phone, you just open up your camera feature on your phone, and uh, run it over this QR code, and it'll take you to our website, Site, which has all new updated research and information about the works. Um, we also have introduced an audio guide feature at Cheekwood, which you can um, rent, uh, um, you know, in, in safe ways uh, from our visitor service center and desk. Um, and there's a, a kind of code that you scan that's also on those signs that will play um, um, more information about those pieces. So lots of different ways um, that you can learn about the works and the history of the trail um, that's been, all been updated. Uh, we have a new visitor brochure and um, a, a brochure for, for the sculpture trail that's in process right now. Um, and so all of that really makes it a, a much more kind of enjoyable experience. Um, the other thing that I would highlight about the enhancement project um, comes from, um, uh, yeah, and you can kind of see this is our new trail our new trailhead map. Um, and so we have these uh, at various spots um, along the trail and also in the uh, in some of the printed materials that we have on it. Um, and you, you can't quite, I know the text is very small and I don't have a pointer, but kind of in that middle part actually, um, kind of dead center where you see that block of text, um, that is a, a, a wayfinder for the Susan and Luke Simmons Blue Pesher Promenade. And this is something that we're really excited about. Um, it's a new plaza and staircase kind of coming down from the, from the mansion into the trail. So it's another access point to the Carroll Trail. Um, and the Simmons uh, have, have you know, endowed this plaza um, and made it possible. And it's really in front of one of our key kind of features, one of our key works on the trail, which is called Blue Pesher. It's by uh, James Terrell. Um, and it's certainly a highlight. This is a work that you can enter into. Um, so we now have a, a much kind of uh, more dramatic, uh, more enjoyable way to enter into this work. And it's um, a piece that is in, in James Terrell's own um, vocabulary is called the sky space. Um, and this is a kind of chamber that you walk into. Um, and it has an oculus cut out of the middle that looks up into the sky. And so for Terrell, it really was, speaking of our, our kind of theme here about thoughtfulness or, or about reflection, this is very much a space that you are supposed to enter into and look up and see these amazing light effects that come from this kind of razor cut oculus um, out to the sky. And, and one of the enhancements that we really addressed with this work is that it also has a lighting cycle to it. Um, and we've really recently upgraded the lights from neon to LED. Um, and what we're really excited about also with having lighting on the trail and having people out there at dusk, this will be something we'll be programming, I think, once things get back a little bit more normal um, and we can kind of be in closer proximity to one another again. Um, but the real ideal time to experience uh, Terrell's Blue Pesher is at dawn or dusk. And why that is, is because there's a programmed lighting sequence that happens um, where the lights change. There's a kind of um, environmental effect or atmospheric event that happens with the lights and it changes how we experience um, the, the sky above and the space that you inhabit in that artwork. Um, so it's really something that we'll be offering as special events um, for kind of dawn and, and dusk or sunrise and sunset programming. This is something that you'll want to pay attention to the website, um, probably into next year. Um, but if you can get out, you know, early, or if you can come late, um, it really is, you know, I, I can speak from experience, it, it, it's always a really wonderful work to enter into. But seeing it at sunrise or sunset, um, it's, it's absolutely a spectacular experience. So we're really excited to, to be able to offer that to our visitors as well. So it sounds like breakfast at Cheekwood is what we call it. <laughs> and then maybe happy hour at Cheekwood. Exactly. Can... Yeah. Come out for one of our night events, grab your cocktail, walk the trail. You know, it'll be a really lo lovely experience. Well, th this particular piece sounds so interesting and, it, and experiential. So if somebody wanted what sounds to me like a very unique 
experience that you're dealing with, again, art and nature. Mm -hmm. um, and it's probably some magic thrown in there as well <laughs> because of what it all showcases with that lighting. It, it just sounds yeah. wonderful. And the fact yeah. that the um, it's, it's one thing to have something beautiful, but to have an endowment that supports the continued care and well-being is is not always available to people and that cheekwood has that just makes all of us feel better and you guys too um yeah. that our community uh, is not going to risk losing it because it wasn't endowed properly exactly and you know and i think something that people you know forget uh especially to do with outdoor sculpture is it's not just about kind of installing a piece and then being able to enjoy it i think when you uh make a commitment to displaying uh and exhibiting outdoor work you're really making a, a long-term commitment to making sure that work is cared for and so it's you know we feel very fortunate to to have um such great donors that are allowing us to really make sure that we can care for these works again for future generations to enjoy well, kudos to the Carols and the Simmons, because this, this is yes. absolutely stunning. Yep. Um, how long ago was the enhancement project completed? Was it just recently done? Yeah, just recently. So uh, it was reopened to the public uh, just this past summer. So this summer, like, so just, you know, a month or so ago. Yeah. Yeah. So in June, it finally reopened. Um, we had wanted to do it in April. And of course, um, you know, had to change our schedule around a little bit. But this is a brand new thing. So we really would love all of you to come out and visit, get your reserve ticket um, and, and come out and see, you know, the kind of improved, new and improved uh, Carol Trail, because it really is a, an incredible um, experience now. And you guys have some fabulous protocols in place so people know that they can be safe when they come out. And, and that that's very important. Mm -hmm. Very important. Yes. Um, so is this the only way that people can experience sculpture at Cheekwood is through this particular, um, through the trail? No, I mean, it's definitely something that we are really, really proud and, and feel fortunate to have on campus. Um, but certainly there are many, many different ways to see sculpture and experience sculpture. And it's something certainly, um, you know, uh, I started at Cheekwood a year ago, and this is very much, you know, a part of my hire and a part of Cheekwood's continued commitment to showing sculpture. Um, and, you know, my focus and certainly what's on the trail, it leans a little bit more contemporary. Uh, but we we actually have a really wonderful, rich collection of what we might refer to as kind of historic sculpture or, um, you know, more art historical sculpture. So, uh, you know, around even outdoors, um, we have numerous pieces that, um, were pieces purchased by the Cheek family um, and, and installed when they live there. So kind of more integrated into our more formal garden spaces. Um, and this is something that we're gonna be working, you know, moving forward to highlight more. Um, we also have works that are not kind of technically on the trail, um, but that were um, kind of contemporaneous to when the trail happened. Um, so kind of closer over to the mansion. And um, I mentioned the Ricky, which is behind the mansion, but there's also a work by an artist named Eric Orr um, and all of these pieces, you know, you can go to our website and see the whole list of all of the outdoor collections that you can you can experience at Chico. But one of my favorites that I always like to mention, I'm sorry I didn't include a slide tonight, um, is by Eric Orr. And um, it's a kind of arch that um, is at the back part of the mansion. And this is something that we are have again been working to uh, restore. And eventually it's something that we'll occasionally shoot fire out of the top of. So it's gonna be a really, really exciting piece to see in person. Uh, right now it has water that comes down um, and, and the whole, when, when the work is fully restored, it has um, steam, uh, fire and water. So it really is about the elements and these kind of dynamic kinetic elements. Um, so it's, a, and that one was commissioned specifically for Cheekwood. So it's a really, really unique piece. So across the campus, there's numerous other works of sculpture um, that we can see. And again, those are available. You can look at those on our website and in our visitors map when you come. Um, they're marked uh, on our map. But as we're looking at here, we also have two other examples of the way that you can experience sculpture at Cheekwood. And 
On the right hand side, we have um, one of our beautiful Chihulis that's currently up. And again, this is definitely worthwhile, uh, you know, for you to come out and, and see Chihuly at Cheekwood, um, a, a, a second presentation of his work um, after I think a decade, that was the last time we sh showed his work. And you can see this um, example, Fiori boat, for example, installed beautifully in our reflecting pool, actually with the work of more historic sculpture uh, installed behind it. So this is an example of how at Cheekwood would, um, we really like to highlight our permanent collection, the works that we own of, of sculpture, but we also um, are really excited to continue offering dynamic exhibitions, temporary special exhibitions um, of sculptors and sculpture at, at Chihuahua. So Chihuly is one example of this, um, and I can tell you that I'm, I'm working on some, some upcoming projects that will be sculpture outside that will be really exciting. And what you see on the left, of course, is a selection of um, sculptures by William Edmondson, who is one of Nashville's most well-known sculptors, uh, who was active in the 1930s and 40s. Um, he's oftentimes kind of associated with folk or self-taught artists. Um, and, you know, he is somebody who is, is, you know, a really important artist to American art history. He was the first Black artist to be given a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art um, in, in the late 30s. And uh, we have one, we actually have the largest collection of William Edmondson works in the entire world. Um, and I'm very excited to say this is going to be something that will be more kind of publicly announcing, but I'll, I'll let you know in the secret right now, um, is that in August of next year, we're going to be presenting a very large scale exhibition of William Edmondson's sculpture at Cheekwood that will be up through the fall. Um, and I'm really excited about this show. We've been working really hard on it. And I think it's going to um, not only highlight our collection of William Edmondson sculptures, um, but also include loans from private and public collections around the United States. So it's really going to give a great picture of William Edmondson's sculptural practice. Um, and an element that I'm really excited about with this exhibition is that we'll have a concurrent presentation um, of part of our collection of William Edmondson that will be um, accessible at the Fisk University Galleries uh, downtown. So you'll, it's a kind of a two-part show um, that's going to be presented at both Cheekwood and, and, and Fisk University. So um, it'll be a really great uh, opportunity to see and learn more about William Edmondson uh, in the fall of 21. Well, that's very exciting. And we're going to want to probably do another segment with you so that we can um, dig into that when you've got more details that you can share. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, as I look at or reflect <laughs> up, upon <laughs> what we just saw at, at the, um, on the trail, and also the Chihuly, it, it, especially with the Chihuly, what stands out to me is the juxtapositioning of mm -hmm. two completely different things and how they work so well together, even though they're completely different art forms. They are sculpture, but completely yeah. different. Um, you can see the statue behind the Chihuly, um, the, the Fiore boat. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's not what's front and center, but you still see it. And it, it's like, it's okay to have this beautiful boat is yeah. what the statue was saying. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and our gardens team does such a great job. It's very much a collaborative relationship um, when we exhibit or install new works and even our existing works. Um, they really do such, I'm, I'm sure Peter Grimaldi will be talking um, next week about this, um, you know, but he he and his team really do such a great job um, of, of complementing and contrasting the sculptures that we have on our campus. And certainly there's a beautiful Chihuly in our color garden that is just kind of bursting with flowers around that create this really great relationship and and also I would you know I would say another enhancement that has has occurred with the Carroll Trail is new landscaping so it's also you know again it's another example of how Cheekwood really is a, a very special and unique place to see art and nature together right art and gardens together um, so it's it's that's also something that makes it special and, and is there very much a part of the enhancement well, and that people can go at their own pace. You're providing them with tons of information, um, especially on the trail that is mm -hmm. right there, and they can dig deeper if they want to, and not if they don't. But mm -hmm. um, it, it's it it really does uh, um, work for so many different kinds of people, and the accessibility um, that's now been added is, is great. And I yeah, Vincent's work. Uh, I'm looking at that bird. Oh my gosh. 
Yeah. I suppose that's for sale, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish, right? <laughs> that, that is gorgeous. Yes. So, um, what what can we expect from the trail going forward? Yeah, so you know, we have some images here of some some of the programming. You know, I think again, what's what's really unique and special about the trail. Um, certainly, it is a, a place to see um, world class uh, sculpture outdoors, contemporary sculpture outdoors, and this is something moving forward. Um, you know, we are very excited and committed to making sure that the Carroll Trail remains a dynamic, active space. So, you know, we are very we feel very fortunate to have the work out there in our permanent collection that we do um, but we are we are looking and pursuing um, acquisitions new acquisitions to add to our permanent collection on the trail um, we are looking at new ways to exhibit and present work on the trail so for example um, there's two chihulis that have been temporarily installed um, along uh, the hickory loop right now that you can see so that's a way again that it kind of energizes and creates the space I mean it very much for me kind of moving forward I, I want the trail to be um, a, a place where visitors can come and see their favorite works um, and revisit them and, and feel kind of some ownership with them. But I also want uh, everybody to go, oh, I wonder what's new at, at, at Chiquit. I wonder what new sculptures out there. So we really do want to kind of keep it fresh um, and exhibit new works. But the other images that we're looking at here um, also speak to the fact that uh, the Carroll Trail uh, provides a really unique environment beyond the artwork or in conjunction with the artwork um, for other types of programming. So, you know, this middle space that we're looking at, this boardwalk um, uh, and kind of middle sized bench, you know, we really envision this as being a place for performances and poetry readings and book readings um, and different kind of gatherings. Again, when we can be in closer proximity to one another, um, you know, certainly we are putting a greater emphasis on wellness programming at Sheikwood. Um, so yoga and meditation um, and also something that maybe some of you may not be as familiar with called forest bathing, um, which is a really kind of unique experience again that um, is about being more in touch with the natural environment and your body in that space so that's something that we are currently already this summer offering um, all of these wellness programs are things that you can sign up for and experience right now at Cheekwood so check the calendar and the website for that um, so you know really for us it's not just oh I'm going to come and look at this work and kind of have this passive experience it's really for us about engendering a whole range of experiences um, at Cheekwood everything from the social whether it's music um, and, you know, kind of food and drink uh, to wellness programs. Um, and certainly, you know, again, when things normalize a little bit more again, um, offering docent tours of the trail. So if you do want to learn more about the works, um, we'll have specific kind of Carol Trail um, tours that will be available about both the the, the, the the natural kind of plantings, but also the sculpture along the trail. So it really is about creating, you know, not just a diversity of works, but a diversity of experiences that are open uh, to everyone. And so the trail is 1.5 miles long. Mm -hmm. Can you say that um, without compromising the intent of 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 the trail that you have room for for much more sculpture oh you're you're, you're, you're yeah <laughs> you're smiling. yes yes i mean i i very much uh, we are not done. We are absolutely, um, you know, really, really open and looking and seeking out opportunities for us to bring new works on both a temporary and permanent basis to the trail. Um, and I think, you know, for me as the curator of sculpture, um, this is something that I want to be really, again, thoughtful about because that's that is the legacy of the trail. So for us, it's it's really trying to identify the types of work that, again, you know, are are unique and bring something fresh and new, but also are works that again do engender certain dialogues around nature um, and 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 uh, again present new visions of what sculpture can be so we are definitely going to be adding more works to the trail um, and and creating um, new experiences well it, it, it looks like um, what you've accomplished is uh, um, a beautiful setting with some thoughtful reflective um, opportunities for people and I think during this COVID, one of the things that we've learned is we've, we've had to change our pace. This has been a huge interrupter and yeah. not, a, not, a, not everything's been horrible, but there's a lot of bad stuff. But the, mm -hmm. when you start trying to make the lemonade out of the lemons, um, you've, you've 
when people get uptight and uh, and and just beyond their capacity to think, one of the best things to do is interact with nature. Whether you yeah. meditate or even if it's just a walk, and you offer that, you can for families, for individuals, a perfect date night. But it's yeah. just a wonderful way to uh, unwind and let your mind relax and just connect again with the universe that yeah. is is mother nature yeah I, yeah I, I think a lot when we well i know you're 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 based in chicago but when you're in nashville i bet you're on this trail a lot all the time why would you why would i be in my office when i could be out on the trail right uh you, a little you know satellite so office there don't you Totally, totally. And, and, and it really is, I think, you know, it does speak to a different type of experience of art. I mean, I think this is why, you know, I know for me, I miss being in museums and galleries right now. Um, it, it's really hard not to just kind of pop in on a lunch break or, or go on the weekend and, and be in a gallery space. And I know, you know, museums are opening our interior galleries, um, you know, are, are open now as well for time entry. Um, but I think, you know, the trail really is a unique space um, for people to have a, a uh, you know, um, a, a slow, a slowed down, again, reflective, but, but also, you know, it's, it's open. Well, so we're sitting here looking at this and it's absolutely stunning. The, uh, what, what you've carved out of mother nature to create the, the man placed and woman placed <laughs> um, pieces of sculpture is absolutely stunning and so well done and i know it's taking a lot of work and and um a lot of thoughtfulness and design <laughs> what do you think it means the trail to the community you know i think it's something that has always been um a really uh it's, it's a commented upon uh, feature of Cheekwood, right? People very much know the trail. Um, people have come accustomed to, to it being there. Um, and and I think it is a very unique feature of Cheekwood uh, in particular. But I think especially uh, what the pandemic has really brought to the fore um, is again, um, this is not just an asset because of the wonderful work on the trail, um, because of the fact that it's a, you know, a mile and a half double loop. Um, but it really, it really is, I think we can think about the Carroll Trail as providing open gallery space, right? Each mm -hmm. each area around every sculpture is like its own little gallery. Um, you can kind of enter into and walk and see this artwork, but it's open, right? And I think open fresh air is something that um, is is really it's an asset to have, and it's something it's it's a way that we can offer experience of artwork all seasons um, to to everyone um, at Cheekwood. And that's something that for us, we we very much feel thankful that we can offer that to our visitors. You know, if, if you um, maybe don't like the idea of being in an interior gallery space right now, you can come and, and take an hour or so and walk the trail at your own pace, uh, get a little exercise, but also have this really kind of wonderful experience um, with art in an open, open gallery space. Um, and I'll also say, you know, in terms of what this what this does mean and and will mean you know over the 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 next generations to to the community is also i think that this is a very um unique feature in the region um, and certainly in the United States. So it's a way also, you know, I think we can have some kind of Nashville pride about this being in in our city, certainly because of the fact that uh, this is world-class art, right? And, and certainly the ways that we're thinking about bringing new work, whether on a temporary or permanent basis to the Carroll Trail, um, we want to continue making this a destination, not only to our local community, but to people who are visiting, to tourists, um, to people who might actually kind of travel just to see what we're offering at Cheekwood in, in the way of sculpture. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's also a kind of civic asset as much as it is one to our own, unique to our own institution. Um, it really is a place where you can come and see some spectacular contemporary sculpture outdoors. Um, and that's something that, you know, um, uh, there's not too many other opportunities to see um, in, in the city, in the region. Um, so, so I think that's also, um, there's a lot of pride, I think, about having this in our community. Well, you've certainly um, incorporated mind, body, and soul um, in terms of um, what you're trying to touch with people. And as as with um, people still trying to be so very careful with where they go and, and how they interact, 
this is just a wonderful opportunity. I, I know some folks are still cooped up um, with their kids and they're looking yeah. for things, actually looking for things to be able to experience and take their kids to and share yeah. and, and this, uh, and then have conversations about it. And yeah, this is a, a beautiful, beautiful way to do that. Yeah. And, and Cheekwood, it, it feels like it's, it's worlds away, but it's nestled right in the middle. Well, not exactly in the middle, but um, <laughs> very <right>. close by. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's easily accessible. Um, and there's such a sense of arrival when you pull up to, to that long drive that takes you through those gates and, mm -hmm. and you've got ample parking there too. You've done a, a wonderful job with that. So it, it makes it, um, family friendly, kid friendly, everybody yeah. friendly. Yeah, and I know, you know, Jane last week uh, mentioned, I'm sure, uh, talked a lot about our, our new children's garden, which was also open roughly at the same time as the new Carol Trail. I know Peter next week will be talking about the Japanese garden that just opened. You know, so really we take pride at Cheekwood about offering a whole range of experiences to everybody. So bring your kids. Um, if you want a quiet night, if you want a quiet moment of reflection, if you want a date night, um, we have pet nights, you know, so so there's, there's really something for everybody. And, you know, 55 acres to experience it with and 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 art uh kind of in every little pocket around those 55 acres so um you know there's definitely a lot to come out and and enjoy and experience so i have to ask you pet night what pet yes out the dog i should say it's dog oriented right i i i am a, a, a dog person and it's international dog day so i only think about dogs but uh yeah you can there, we have certain nights uh, certain days um and events throughout the year uh where you can bring your dog and and uh let let them enjoy it with you well if i had a dog i'd bring my dog and i'm not gonna bring <laughs> cats i don't think anybody would enjoy that Probably yeah <laughs> see that that hair and um take after it yeah <laughs> Well, it's been such a pleasure speaking with you. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our audience, our live from the view audience? Uh, no, we just culture? we've covered a lot. We have, and I just, you know, I want to thank you for your time and thank everybody for joining us. Um, you know, definitely check out the website. Our calendar, you know, has all the different events and programming going on. Um, and a lot of that new research that's gone into our sculpture across our campus, uh, you can learn more about it there and any kind of special events and programming and exhibitions that we have coming up um, will also be, will be available there. Well, I know a lot of work has gone into creating what you all have created and then also to make it user friendly and accessible um, in, in and when I mean accessible to, for the information as well as people who have special needs. So mm -hmm. um, congratulations. And I thank you so very, very much, Marin. Um, yeah, I, I hope I get to meet you sometime in person when you're actually in Nashville. That would be yeah. A and um, we look forward to speaking with Peter Grimaldi next week at the same time um, to learn more about the gardens. At, at Wonderful. So, Wonderful. Thank you so much. And I hope to see everybody at Cheekwood. Thank you so much. And we're, at, we're signing off from live from The View. Thank you, Cheekwood. <laughs>